Wake up. It's the Sleep Unplugged podcast with Dr. Chris Winter, episode 38, Coffee and Sleep. There's too much caffeine in your bloodstream. Welcome everyone to the episode. My name is Dr. Chris Winter. I'm a sleep specialist and neurologist and host of the show. Very excited for you to be here. If you're new to the show, welcome to the Sleep Unplugged family. If you're a veteran of the show, welcome back. Great to see you again. Before we get started, if you want to get in touch with the show, you can find me at Dr. Chris Winter on Twitter, Dr. Chris Winter Instagram, Dr. Chris Winter TikTok. That's the easiest way to communicate. Contact the show. Tell us what you think. Praise us, criticize us, correct us. We're open to any and all communications. We also have a YouTube page, Sleep Unplugged YouTube page, where we put the videos of all these podcasts on there. You may be, if you're watching the video, you may be noticing that the backdrop that you typically see is different. That's because I'm in Arizona with the Cleveland Guardians baseball organization, helping their amazing staff and talented players with things related to sleep. Really excited to be here with them today. They're a great organization. I think this is my ninth season with them. And... They're just a wonderful, wonderful organization to work for. So this is an exciting episode, Caffeine. We're going to dive into it before we do. We always take a couple viewer comments, uh, listener comments. I've got a few here. First is from Little White Dog Properties. And speaking of Little White Dog Properties, we still have Sleep Unplugged podcast hats available. If you're interested in one, DM me and we can work that out. Uh, pretty easy. They're $25, I think, was the price we set for them. That's essentially just covering the cost. And I'll ship it right out to you. Little dog, little white dog properties ordered one. And her question was related to our previous episode on daylight saving time, which we talk a lot about on the show. She says, Hello, with the impending doom of daylight saving time coming up, I was wondering if you know of people who attempt to stay on standard time instead of making the change. My schedule would allow me to continue to get up and go to sleep at the same time until June when I would have transitioned in order to get up before it gets too hot to walk my dog. I would really, I could easily switch back to standard time in September when it cools back down. Just wondering if you've heard of anyone doing this successfully. Thank you. You know, I actually reached out. Thank you, uh, little white dog properties. I actually reached out to another friend of the show, Little White Dog Properties, definitely a friend of the show, definitely a hat owner, reached out to another friend of the show, Karen Johnson, our guru queen sleep expert on all things daylight saving slash standard time. She's a huge proponent of making standard time permanent, which we all should be behind because that's where the science lies. And she said, oof, wouldn't recommend that. You know, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with it. You could do it. You could stay on that sleep and wake time. I think where you're going to run into trouble is trying to sort of maintain the standard time sleep wake schedule, but you got to meet your friend for coffee. You got to be at this place for the show to begin at this time. I, I think that it could be com become confusing to sort of be, have a foot in both worlds. I think that's where Karn was coming from saying, oh, I wouldn't recommend doing that. We have actually counseled teams to say, look, when you fly out to this place to play this team, it might be a good idea for you all just to keep your schedule on your home time zone, you know, so you can do it temporarily. I think Buddy, what was that coach of the Jets? He was interested in keeping the New York Jets on Buddy Ryan. I think he was interested in keeping the New York Jets on East Coast time for the entire season or something like that. So I think it just becomes a logistical nightmare. But theoretically, you could do it. And we know if you listen to the show, being on standard time is the healthier place to be in terms of light. And it's just too bad we can't get rid of this back and forth change be on standard time and, and move on with our lives. So thank you very much for that communication. Last week, we did a communicate, we did a episode on cannabis, marijuana, cannabinoids, and how they affect sleep. That was episode 37. And Rick writes, 
I'm a big fan of your podcast, and it has really helped me reevaluate my sleep in terms of how I view the quality and quantity in a more positive light. Well, that's great. I was struck by your ending comment on your last episode regarding sleep and THC, where you said outside of using this to reduce anxiety, they're doing nothing related to your sleep. I'm curious to understand your thinking as it relates to anxiety and sleep. They seem to be highly intertwined. If you're sleeping better, you would tend to be less anxious. And conversely, if you deal with anxiety, you're likely less likely to, if you're dealing with anxiety, you're likely to be sleeping less well. Really appreciate that communication, Rick. Uh, I'm glad the podcast is helping. Couple things. Number one, the idea that THC is doing nothing related to your sleep, not true. It's probably doing nothing positive for your sleep. It may be doing negative things to your sleep, especially if you're using these things chronically. So, and, and that's important because I think that the answer to this question is, sure, I think there may be medicinal uses for these products outside of sleep that could be positive, maybe anxiety is one. I don't think that I'm qualified to really make that determination. But from my perspective as a neurologist, a sleep neurologist, I've looked at the data of some of these products and anxiety, and I think there's some compelling information there. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I'm, I'm willing to say, sure, these things may be helpful in acute anxiety or the management of anxiety disorders. The problem is that doesn't change the fact that chronic use of these chemicals may be harmful to your sleep. So we can think of this in terms of alcohol. Alcohol can be anxiolytic. It can reduce anxiety. In fact, isn't that the, that's the stereotype. Acute anxiety, you, I need some drinks. I need to have a drink. I had a really troubling day today. So you have a couple shots of bourbon and, and you feel more relaxed. So just because these things treat anxiety doesn't mean we're doing something positive for sleep. And this is sort of the art of medicine, isn't it? It's the balancing of the radiation will shrink your tumor, but it does put you at risk for other cancers down the line. So we're going to choose one and we'll take what comes with that. And maybe that's what you do in the treatment of anxiety. I do think that using this medication to help somebody with acute anxiety might in some ways help their sleep, but they're still taking a medication that chronic, chronic use of could in fact harm it. So I think that when he says at the end, if you're sleeping better, you would tend to be less anxious. I agree with that. However, if you're, the medication that you're using is facilitating poor sleep, you might be working against yourself a little bit. So once again, we can have one or the other. We are constantly in medicine giving pain medications to alleviate somebody's chronic pain, but we actually make their sleep apnea and breathing much worse. So it's all sort of a balancing act, but I really appreciate that comment. Rick, and I'm really glad the show has been helpful to you. So let's get into caffeine. Before we do, we'll, I'll reference the title of the episode. There's too much caffeine in your bloodstream. This was from a song, A Rush and a Push and the Land is Ours. It was a Smith song. It was the first track off their final album. The Smiths only released four studio albums. This was from their fourth album, Strange Ways, Here We Come, which nobody in the band initially liked the title except for Morrissey. Strange Ways was the old name of a prison uh, near where they lived. They didn't like the reference. They thought it was a little bit too cheeky and obvious. But uh, Johnny Marr said he grew to like the title, which is kind of great. But anyway, this was the first song off the album. The title, A Rush and a Push and the Land is Ours, is actually taken from a poem written by Jane Wilde, who was Oscar Wilde's mother that Morrissey liked. And if you know Morrissey, a very cerebral guy, when they were recording this album, the band was kind of fracturing and breaking up and they would actually record in the studio that actually was owned at the time by Tears for Fears. And they would record and then Morrissey would just go to his bedroom and go to bed. They said he would curl up with a Sylvia Plath an anthology and go to sleep. And the rest of the band would just party all night long, get into wine and drink and have this big thing. So those parties were sort of famous 
but the lead singer, the main person was just nowhere to be found. So it's not surprising that they would take the name of this song from a Jane Wilde poem. It's widely thought, Strange Ways Hooper Comes, thought to be the Smiths' finest album, even though it was their fourth. So a brief flash, we've got these four great albums. I'm personally a fan of Louder Than Bombs, but certainly Girlfriend in a Coma off their final album cannot be ignored. So let's get into caffeine. It's a it's a big deal. People drink caffeine. It's It's funny when you actually look at caffeine research papers, every one of them starts off with the fact that caffeine is the most widely consumed psychoactive drug in the world. Man, if you were writing a paper about caffeine, I think there must be some sort of federal law that that has to be in the first paragraph. And I love it because you just really get the sense that every time you read it, that author thinks, I've got a great opening for my paper. I'm going to blow you away with the fact that, did you know, caffeine is the most widely consumed psychoactive drug in the world. I, I at least saw it in 10 different papers, you know, in some way. So I, I, I love that. So the history of caffeine is fantastic. The history of caffeine research is even better. And before we get going on it, do people drink caffeine? Lots of people drink caffeine. They did a study of a bunch of, you know, 18 to 58 year olds and said that 90% of people not only drink it, but drink it well into the afternoon. 69% of people drink it well into the evening. So lots of people drinking, drinking caffeine. So let's look at the history of caffeine research. The, the biggest research, the biggest formal research of caffeine early on was from the early 1900s, 1911, 1912. A guy named Harry Levi Hollingworth was a psychologist and he was approached by Coca-Cola who said, we'd like for you to research the effects of caffeine on sleep and the people who drink Coca-Cola and we'll pay you to do it. He said, no, I don't want to do that. He said, that's not real, genuine, academic psychology research. This is blasphemy. I'm not going to do it. And then Coca-Cola pulled out their checkbook and he said, when do I start? So it's interesting. His actions were really important because for the first time, he started bringing academically rigorous research to the study of psychology, controlled studies, double-blinded studies. And he also brought this incredible rigor in terms of his approach to dealing with the people who employed him. We were talking last week, hey, when you're reading a paper about marijuana, go right to the conflicts of interest. He's being paid by Coca-Cola, but he basically said to them, no matter what I find in favor of you, not in favor of you, I get to publish it. I'm in control of this data. And they said, sure. So he started looking at the effects of caffeine in, this, in these studies and basically came to the conclusion that, quote, doses higher than six grains disturb sleep in most participants in the study. And so you're thinking, what is a grain? Well, a grain is about 65 milligrams. So six grains is 389 milligrams. Okay, Chris, well, what does that mean? When you actually look at caffeine content in coffee, I think the easiest way to think about it is a typical cup of coffee that you get, a little white styrofoam cup, 100 milligrams of caffeine. Espresso, probably smaller amount, 75. Espresso. A lot of people think espressos have more caffeine. They actually have fewer milligrams of caffeine because the water gets pushed through at high pressure very quickly. So a lot of the caffeine is not, ex is not expressed. So it's an express push of the water through there versus a slow drip and obviously espresso where it, where it come from comes from so when you're thinking about okay well 389 grain or i'm sorry 389 milligrams six grains cup of coffee 100 milligrams espresso 75 when you're looking at a grande latte at starbucks 330 the extra large duncan coffee 
500. So you get a sense of, could you get a coffee drink that has 389 milligrams of caffeine in it in today's modern times? Absolutely, you could. Or you could drink a couple one, you know, 100 milligram cups and get it. So that's the range we're sort of thinking about when we're talking about uh, these older studies. So what is caffeine? Let's get into what caffeine is before we talk about the bad and the good of caffeine. So caffeine belongs in a chemical family called methylxanthines. You're aware of caffeine. There's also a chemical theophylline. There's also paraxanthine. Theophylline, you often find in black teas, a little bit less in green teas, cocoa. So when you're drinking teas, it's less about the caffeine and more about the theophylline. And then paraxanthine is what caffeine is a metabolite of what caffeine gets broken down into. So all these chemicals are sort of what we're talking about. So when we're thinking about caffeine, what is caffeine actually doing in the brain? Well, there caffeine is blocking adenosine, which is a chemical in our brain, from binding adenosine receptors. So adenosine is a chemical. It wants to bind a receptor in your brain to create a chemical change and a chemical signal. And caffeine blocks that from happening. So, and generally it's happening at the A1 receptor, although there is an A2A receptor that's important for sleep as well too. So great, Chris, it's blocking adenosine from binding this receptor. What is adenosine? What is adenosine doing? Adenosine is a, basically a receptor antagonist. It is fighting with caffeine um, in terms of adenosine blocking that receptor. And adenosine is very similar to adenine, which is a uh, nucleo base. Remember you, the Watson-Crick model of DNA, uh, A binds to T, C binds to G. A is adenine. Um, and adenine is related to adenosine. Adenosine is a byproduct of the metabolism of ATP. So when you learned about chemical energy from our food, we get this chemical energy from ATP. ATP is metabolized. And one of the products it is metabolized to is adenosine. So adenosine builds up in the brain and early research from you know going pretty far back, people realized that adenosine and ATP, unlike caffeine when given or applied to a neural situation created sedation and sleep versus caffeine having more of an alerting effect. So when adenosine binds that A1 receptor, there is, there is, there is sleep promotion. So in the early eighties, adenosine was sort of worked out in terms of its function related to sleep in sort of pioneering research in cats. That's when it was kind of figured out that, Hey, adenosine might be this sort of homeostatic chemical that we've talked about. I've got this very old medical textbook called the new handbook of health. And it talks about sleep being a response to the buildup of fatigue poisons in the brain, fatigue poisons. And what they're, what they were referring to, even though they didn't know at the time was the fact that as adenosine builds up in the brain, it creates a stronger and stronger drive to sleep. If you feel tired at 7 p.m., you'll probably feel really tired at midnight. And if you keep staying up until 4 a.m., that drive to sleep is going to become more and more and more intense because of the continued buildup of adenosine. And it's really interesting that when you look at adenosine, its primary place of functioning in terms of creating sleep is in the basal forebrain. And what's really interesting is there is an acute drop at the onset of rest. So when you lie down to sleep or take a nap or just close your eyes and meditate, the drop in adenosine content in your brain is not linear. It drops very quickly initially, and then that drop sort of slows down. And so it becomes extremely important for us to sleep to eliminate adenosine from our brain, which is sleep promoting. So when we get our eight hours of sleep, we wake up, we feel refreshed, and we're ready to go because we've theoretically eliminated that adenosine from 
our brain. And it's interesting to go back to last week's episode or maybe the week before, somebody named Brock wrote in and said, I'm participating in this very bizarre polyphasic sleep schedule and really wasn't getting that much sleep. But when you think about potentially what adenosine is doing here, it does sort of lend itself to if you can get in there and get a little short nap or a little short period of rest and get that majority drop of adenosine, hey, that that rest period, that nap can be very refreshing. So one of the things I'm telling all the baseball players that I work with is you've got to find time every day to take 15 minutes, close your eyes and just rest because doing that potentially can really help to eliminate adenosine and really help you feel more awake during the day. So let's talk about the good and the bad of caffeine. What is it doing? What is real? What is lore? What is beneficial? What's harmful? Do we start with the good? Should we start with the bad? Okay, let's start with the bad news first, and then we will proceed to the good news. And speaking of the bad news, there was a great quotation by Tom Roth. I'm going to touch on a study he did looking at the question I get asked all the time, when do you have to cut your caffeine off for it not to affect your sleep? How far before you go to bed do you need to cut, you know, no more caffeine before? And, and we'll get to that. In that study, he wrote the risk of sleep, I'm sorry, the risk to sleep and alertness of regular caffeine use are getting under, I'm sorry, I mean, I can't read my own handwriting. I really wanted to get this quote right. The risk of sleep and alertness, the, I'm sorry, the risk to sleep and alertness of regular caffeine use is getting underestimated by both the general population and physicians. I'm sorry, he's greatly underestimated. God, I really butchered that. I'm sorry, Dr. Roth. Dr. Roth is a hero of mine. I just completely slaughtered that. We'll do it one more time. The risk to sleep and alertness of regular caffeine use are greatly, the, the risks are greatly underestimated by both the general population and physicians. The bottom line is this. He was saying back in 2008, we need to pay attention to this. And there are real dangers related to caffeine use. I have seen personally in my career, I think two or three younger people who came in with changes in their neurological exam. And when we popped up their you know, head CT MRI, strokes everywhere. And they were coming from significant caffeine use. So we need to be careful with this, particularly in the day of energy drinks and, and easily accessible you know, caffeine pills. There is a risk that goes along with it that far exceeds you know, risks to sleep. So just wanted to make that point. So what are we looking at when we're thinking about risks to sleep? And there probably is a preferential thing here where these risks are more, more pressing and problematic to older individuals than to young, which is really interesting in terms of what comes out of research, I definitely feel caffeine affects me more as an older individual than I did when I was younger. So let's look at the number one, decreased total sleep time. Shouldn't be a big shock to people. Number two, reduced sleep efficiency. Of the time you spend in bed, how much of that time are you actually spending sleeping? Number three, prolonged sleep latency. So ingesting caffeine is going to take you longer to fall asleep. And that research goes back to the early 70s. That was one of the first things that was really discovered about caffeine. Hey, when you take this close to the time you go to bed, it makes it harder for that individual to go to bed. Number four, reduced slow wave sleep. So that's the deep sleep. That's the good stuff that makes you feel young makes your body recover, makes you not get sick, makes you kick illnesses much faster. And what's really interesting about that is that there isn't really any evidence that you're getting a compensatory rebound, meaning that when the caffeine is metabolized, the, the slow wave sleep doesn't just come back, you just lost it. It, it doesn't 
doesn't happen when you're when you're having caffeine close to the time when you go to bed. More arousals during the night, more wakefulness during the night, more stage one, which is that kind of transitional sleep, perhaps more light sleep and sleep spindle activity. Sleep spindles are a signature of, of stage two sleep, which is light sleep. And finally, a, a reduced perception of quality. So all of this stuff's going on, but at the same time, the individual is very likely to say, oh, I didn't sleep really well which is exactly sort of how I feel, regardless of what my you know, Withings watch says, I don't feel like I sleep as well when I drink the caffeine. In 2000, it, it's interesting, there was a study that was done where they were looking at all these different things and all the things I just named, they found. And in the discussion part of the study, there was an interesting quotation from the author who said, as expected, caffeine has no effect on REM sleep for any time to, of the administration. And that was in the Roth paper I'm going to talk about in just a second. However, there was a 2021 Swiss study that came out in the Journal of Biological Rhythms that said, and this was only 20 males, they were ingesting an average of about 478 milligrams of caffeine per day. That's a little bit more, that's more like seven grains of of, of caffeine, uh, a little over seven grains. And they said, no, 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 caffeine definitely does shorten the amount of time you spend in REM and increases REM latency, meaning that from the time you go to bed until your cycle of REM, that time is expanded. So usually once you get in bed, you're going to start dreaming or going to REM sleep in about 90 minutes on average. So what they're saying is contrary to earlier research, this contemporary research is showing that no, it may delay REM sleep, which is not a healthy thing to do. So REM sleep, a little bit more in question, but newer research is sort of showing that, hey, this might be a problem. So let's get to that Roth paper really quick. This was a paper done in 2013 by Tom Roth and some others that basically set out to say, look, we talk about cutting caffeine off before you go to bed. This is a common question that gets asked in the media, but there's surprisingly little research that is exploring that. So let's do that. We're going to give caffeine to individuals, 400 milligrams, and we're going to give it right when they go to bed, three hours before they go to bed, six hours before they go to bed. Bottom line with the study is three hours before you go to bed and right when you go to bed was bad. Lots of bad things happen with that. But with the six hours before bed, what they found was 41 minutes fewer total sleep time. Now that approached significance, but didn't quite meet it. Meaning that if I've got a magic penny, you're going to be like, prove it. I'm like, well, I'll show you because every time I flip it, it lands heads. And so I flip it and it lands heads. See magic penny. And you're going to say, well, that doesn't prove anything. You had a 50, 50 shot. It was going to land heads. Oh, well, okay. I'll do it again. I flip it a second time and it lands heads again. And you're and I'll say, well, see, it's I told you it's magic. And you're like, well, still, Chris, that's 25% shot that that would have happened. And so how many times am I going to have to flip the coin and it land heads before you're offering money for said coin? That's the way we sort of look at papers in terms of statistical significance. So in this study, the individuals who had caffeine at six hours seem to have 41 fewer minutes of sleep versus people who are getting placebo. So what they're saying is it could have been chance. It could have been within that margin of error, but it really approached significance. Perhaps if we had had more subjects and we're bit, we had more money to do the study, we could have shown this, but we're going to, we're going to put this in the paper, but you can take it with a grain of salt. The other thing that happened is it doubled the time it took individuals to fall asleep, getting that caffeine six hours before versus not. Once again, though, that did not meet statistical standards either. So could have been chance that that was the, the case. So, but, it, but their conclusion was clearly, we see a signal here that caffeine use six hours before you go to bed, 400 milligrams. So- Grande latte from Starbucks. 
which I love. I love a good latte. I love a good Starbucks grande latte, whatever. Um, they do a good job. So sitting there watching your TV show, drinking your latte, relaxing after a difficult day, sounds great. They're saying drinking right before you go to bed, terrible, but man, six hours, you go to bed 11 o'clock, you can't have a latte at five o'clock right after work. Okay, as soon as work's over, let's meet the coffee shop. We'll have a lovely latte and then we'll have plenty of time to metabolize it. Well, not so fast. So let's switch gears and let's talk about the positives to caffeine. Are they actually improving sleepiness, cognitive function? Is there a positive here to the caffeine? And I think the answer is probably yes. And the most compelling use of caffeine seems to be when two conditions are met. Number one, you haven't had caffeine in 24 hours. That's that's the good stuff. My son used to use like little caffeine gels before he swam. And he wouldn't drink caffeine between the weekly swim meets or whatever. He would save it for the day of the swim meet. An hour before he swam, he would take a certain amount of caffeine and that seemed to work well for him. So that's the first criteria is that you haven't had caffeine in a while. This You're not a chronic user of it. Number two, that you're a bit sleep deprived. The, the pump is primed, so to speak, meaning that if you're not at all sleep deprived and you ingest caffeine, you're not going to become more awake than normally awake is essentially what a lot of people believe. So if you are sleepy and haven't had caffeine in a while, that's where you're going to get the most effect. Data is not great when you're sleepy, but you've been drinking caffeine within 24 hours or not sleepy um, and haven't had it within 24 hours. Both of those don't seem to show as robust results. There is a question as to whether or not caffeine or adenosine seems to affect circadian rhythms. And I'm going to leave that by saying maybe, number one, number two, it seems to be a weak relationship. And number three, caffeine does not seem to affect the circadian rhythm. The evidence for caffeine affecting the circadian rhythm is not as profound as the evidence for adenosine, perhaps affecting it as well too. Lots of studies showing that perhaps there are some cognitive benefits. I remember my roommate in college, Vikas Parekh, who's a big time doctor at the University of Michigan right now, his sister, back when we were in college, was doing research on caffeine and cognition. I'll never forget Vikas, who's probably one of the smartest people I've ever met, said to me, hey, before you take any significant test, drink a Coke. I was like, why? He said, the caffeine will make you smarter. So even back in the early 90s, we were talking about the effects of caffeine on psychological uh, quickness and memory recall of doing well on math tests in college. The International Society of Sports Nutrition in 2021 came out with their position paper. And I'm going to end with that since we're here in, in Arizona for spring training. And they basically said, let's talk about what we believe caffeine can do for individuals from a performance perspective. Number one, we think it improves muscle endurance. Number two, movement velocity. Number three, muscular strength. Number four, sprinting, jumping, and throwing performance. And a wide array of aerobic and anaerobic sports actions, predominantly aerobic. That's where they felt the most bang for the buck is. Uh, most effective if you're ingesting about three to six kilogram, milligrams per kilogram of athlete body weight. Smaller doses than that seem to have no effect. Bigger doses seem to create problems. And timing it 60 minutes before exercise seems to work best, which is exactly like I said, what my son did. So I think that there is movement here in terms of can caffeine be used as a performance enhancing drug for an athlete? Can it be used as a performance enhancing drug for all of us? I think the answer is yes. I think there's some pretty compelling research that th that's there. Is it harmful to our sleep? Will the swimmer who takes it an hour before they swim in the finals that always happen in the evening, you always do your prelims in the morning, finals in the evening, is that negatively going to affect their sleep? Maybe affect their prelims the next morning, potentially. So 
like we started off this episode with talking about THC and anxiety, you take the good with the bad. And I think caffeine has a little bit of both. So that's the episode I wanted to cover. I'm very excited we got to work in the Smiths. Very excited that we finally addressed caffeine, which I think was an important topic. Really want to hear what you all have to say, what your experiences is with caffeine. Please reach the show, Dr. Chris Winter Twitter, Dr. Chris Winter Instagram, Dr. Chris Winter TikTok. We've got hats available. Like and subscribe to the podcast. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you're interested in my books, I've written The Sleep Solution, Why Your Sleep's Broken, How to Fix It, as well as The Rested Child, Why You're Tired, Wired, or Irritable Child May Have a Sleep Disorder, and How to Help. Speaking of caffeine, head on out to Florida, Arizona, find your favorite baseball team, take in some spring training action with a caffeinated beverage of your choice in your lap, and enjoy one of the great sporting events on this planet. Until next week, my name is Chris Winner. This is the Sleep Unplugged podcast. Thanks for listening. Sleep well.